Hi, everyone. Thank you to my students who came to see me talk on a Saturday when they didn't even have to. My little heart is just breaking. All right. I'm about to take control of your brain. Are you ready? This is my graduate student, Maria Ruiz Blondet. And this is about one second of her brain activity. And you didn't know it, but in the video I was just showing you, the screen changed color every time there was a peak or a valley in Maria's brain activity. The idea of a video like this is to stimulate your brain in sync with the brain activity of someone else and, and that stimulation cause your brain activity to start to resemble the brain activity of another person. When we do this in the laboratory, when we show people videos like this in the laboratory, there's a very distinct change in ongoing brain activity that occurs shortly after we start stimulating someone like this. Why would we want to do this? Why would we want to try to make someone's brain activity more like someone else's? Well, what if somebody, like my research assistant, Aaron Baker, wanted to impersonate the brain activity of someone else? What if he wanted to sneakily sneak by and have his brain activity fool someone into thinking that he was Maria? Why would anyone want to do that? Why would anybody want their brain activity to look like the brain activity of someone else? That's what I'm going to tell you today. It starts with this woman. This is Ursula van der Leyen. She's a German Minister of Defense. In 2014, a hacker member of the Chaos Computer Club stole Ursula van der Leyen's fingerprint simply by taking a high-resolution photograph of her hands without her knowledge at a press conference. Having done this, he made the high-resolution scan of her fingerprints available online. And now every system in the entire German defense network that was secured with van der Leyen's fingerprint is compromised, and not only compromised, but compromised forever. That's because van der Leyen cannot grow a new finger. He stole her fingerprint. Nothing secured with her fingerprint is safe anymore. Perhaps even more alarming, on September 23rd of this year, so just a couple of weeks ago, the New York Times reported that Chinese cyber espionage agents had stolen the fingerprints of 5.6 million American workers. Just like van der Leyen's fingerprints, any system that was secured with those fingerprints is now compromised. The, nu the nuclear launch codes, the army bases, and all of our tax information sitting on the IRS servers is now compromised, and not just compromised, but compromised forever. Because none of those people can grow their finger fingers back again. They can't grow new fingers. Those are done for. What these anecdotes, I hope, shows you is that for the most secure information these days, things we really don't want hackers to get their hands on, a biometric credential like a fingerprint is simply not secure enough. And that's why my lab has developed the BrainPrint protocol, the next generation of brain biometrics. This is something literally out of a science fiction movie. And when I say literally, I mean literally. I mean the movie X-Men 2. If any of you have seen the movie X-Men 2, you know that in X-Men 2, Professor X, played by Patrick Stewart here, has a system called the Cerebro system that helps him to amplify his telepathy. That's what that funny hat is that he's wearing. The Cerebro system is keyed to Professor X's brain activity. So in the film, when the villain, Mystique, tries to illicitly use the Cerebro system, it notices that her brain activity is not the brain activity of Professor X, and it painfully ejects her from the system. Our brain print system works the same way, without the pain. It doesn't hurt anybody. 
Let's say this is Professor X's brain print. This is a real brain print, but it doesn't belong to Professor X because he's fictional, but the brain print is real. If Professor X wants to get into a system that's secured by the brain print, he provides his brain activity a second time, and if his brain activity the second time matches his brain print provided the first time, the system recognizes him and lets him in. But if someone like Mystique tries to sneak into the system and provide her brain activity to the brain print system, it recognizes that that brain activity does not match Professor X's, and it doesn't give her access. My, this sounds crazy, right? It's from a science fiction movie. You're actually, you, 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 I want you to believe that we can actually do this. We can actually do this. My laboratory is the first laboratory worldwide to show that in a pool of 30 people, we can identify someone on the basis of their brain activity 100% of the time. That's right, I said 100%. You can't get higher than 100%. That's as good as it gets. It's good that we can do this. It's good that we can identify people from, from their brain activity. Because there's a lot of characteristics of brain prints that we think make them superior to something like fingerprints. <clears throat> so for example, if you've seen the Quentin Tarantino alias episode, which is the best alias episode, hands down, you know that if you want to get into a safe that's secured by a fingerprint biometric, one really easy way to do it is to just cut off the finger of someone who can get into the safe. You cut off his finger, you take the finger, you walk over to the safe, you put the finger up against the biometric plate, and in you go and you steal whatever you want. You can't do that with brain prints. If you take somebody's brain out of their head, it stops working. If you chop somebody's head off, it stops working. So you can't do that. Well, that didn't actually work for Quentin T Tarantino either in the Alias episode. So what's the next thing you might want to do if you want to try to break into a safe that's secured by a fingerprint? Well, you have a big gun like Quentin Tarantino has. You could put it to somebody's head and say, hey, put your fingerprint on the biometric plate or I'm going to blow your brains out. We don't think this would work for, to break into a brain print system either. And the reason for that is that it's very well known that when a person is placed under stress, like they would be placed under certainly if someone was, someone was threatening to shoot them, when a person is placed under stress, their brain activity changes dramatically. It changes so much that sometimes you can see it with the naked eye in the, in the brain recordings. You don't even need fast, fancy software or fancy computer systems to pull it out. So we think that if somebody threatened a brain print user to try to force them to give access to the brain print system, it wouldn't work because their brain activity would change too much. A final advantage that brain prints have over fingerprints. As I alluded to when I was talking about van der Leyen and the Chinese espionage, I said that those fingerprints are compromised forever because people can't grow new fingerprints. But brain prints don't share that characteristic. So for example, Professor X's brain print that I showed you earlier happens to be brain activity that was recorded while the person, not Professor X, was looking at pictures of black and white foods. If, in the unlikely event that somebody was able to steal Professor X's brain print, this version could be canceled and a new one could be recorded, perhaps in response to something like celebrity faces, which is another type of simulation that we use in my lab. So, Brain prints seem like they have a lot of features to them that make them more secure than fingerprints. There's some reasons to think that, this, that using brain prints to secure our most classified information could be more, more surefire than using a fingerprint. But there's still one way. There's still one way that a person might be able to break the brain print system and get into a brain print protected system. And that's by impersonation. So what if, now back to the beginning of the talk, my research assistant Aaron wants to break into a brain print system that's been keyed to my, my graduate student Maria's brain activity. Could he do it? This is what we try to find out. We showed Aaron, we trained Aaron by showing him a video that was exactly like the one, actually it was the same one that you saw at the beginning of the talk, but you had to watch it for 30 seconds and Aaron had to watch it for 12 hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing that Aaron is a super guy. I wish he could be here today, actually. He couldn't. Um, but he's a super guy. And, and for science 
and because he likes learning about the brain and because he's a super guy, he endured watching this video for 12 hours. And this is the big test. This is the big test because if somebody can break into a brain print system just by watching a stupid video for 12 hours, then all the stuff I said before about brain prints being really secure probably doesn't really amount to much. So what did we find? Just to orient you, we can look at, for example, how similar Maria's brain activity is the second time she submits a brain print to, how, to the first time she tries to submit a brain print. So there's three bars on this graph, and the Maria Maria bar is the biggest. <laughs> so Maria to Maria is the most similar. That's good. If that weren't true, this whole setup wouldn't be working very well. If we compare Aaron's brain activity to Maria's at the start of training, those two things are much less similar to each other. That's the smallest bar of the three. But if we compare Aaron's brain activity to Maria's brain activity at the end of training, what you can see is that it's become more similar to Maria's brain activity. The training worked. Just by watching this video for 12 hours, Aaron was able to make his brain activity more like Maria's. But it's important to point out that even though the training worked, and that's kind of amazing, we made some guy's brain work more like someone else's brain just by flashing lights at him. That's, that's pretty awesome. But it's important to point out that even though Aaron's brain activity got more like Maria's, it wasn't good enough to fool the brain print algorithm. Maria's brain activity is still more similar to Maria's than Aaron's is. So this is pretty great. We can train someone's brain but we can't train it well enough to beat the brain print algorithm. But now that we've opened this can of worms, now that we know that we can train Aaron's brain to behave a little bit more like Maria's, now there's some interesting possibilities here. So for example, what if, at least at the start of training, Maria loves sushi, but Aaron hates it? What if we then show him 12 hours of Maria's sushi-loving brain activity and try to stimulate his brain in a sushi-loving pattern. Will that be enough to make him start to like sushi? Will we finally be able to get Aaron to go with us to a sushi restaurant? Wouldn't that be great? I'm a vegan, so I can say this. Wouldn't that be great if you got your vegan friends to be able to go to a meat restaurant with you? That would be great. More seriously, though, what if we could use a system like some technology like this for more serious purposes? What if we could take someone that's deathly afraid of spiders and make them less afraid of spiders by training their brain to behave like the brain of someone that isn't afraid of spiders? What if we could take the brain of someone that has PTSD, say, from a combat situation that suffers every time they hear a car backfire and train their brain to respond to a car backfire the way some person who has never been in combat does and doesn't get upset when they hear a car firing. Even raising the stakes higher, what if we could take poor Jennifer Aniston, who's forced to see Brad Pitt's face plastered all over the known universe, even after their terrible breakup, and heal her heart so that when she sees Brad Pitt's face, she doesn't have to be sad anymore. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we could do that? We don't know if we're going to be able to do that. We've only just started this research. So if you want to find out, you're going to have to stay tuned and come back to homecoming next year. Thank you.